Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Atsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello there. Welcome to podcast number 146 of ADHD for Smartass Women. I am your host, Tracy Otsuka. Thank you so much for joining me here. And you may subscribe to this podcast and our newsletter over at tracyoutsuka.com forward slash podcast. So last week, I talked about why we struggle with time. And today, I'm going to be talking about some practical strategies for being on time. I'm also going to share some ideas on planning better. You know, I've, I've been in New York City now. Well, I'm back home now, but I was in New York City for over a month. The whole idea for going there is both of my kids live in the West Village. And so I thought it would be a great opportunity to be able to spend some more time with them. But I've also been writing a book proposal. And for those of you who have followed this podcast for a while, you know that I really struggle with long-form writing. So, of course, in my brain, I thought, well, if I go to the West Village where all those famous authors wrote their books, maybe some of it will rub off on me. Well, that did not exactly work. So I ended up with all of these post-it notes, literally hundreds of post-it notes in the apartment that we were staying at. And they were plastered all over this wall because, you know, big picture, that's how my brain works. I need to see the big picture. And um, it was my husband's birthday. He was celebrating a big birthday and we had some friends fly out who were meeting us and they were going to come to this apartment. (laughs) And I literally had these green and hot pink and yellow and blue post-it notes everywhere. And it suddenly dawned on me the morning that they were coming that, oh my gosh, I've got to get rid of all these post-it notes all over the walls. So I literally sat there with my computer and I organized all the post-it notes, got them off my wall. It took me several hours. And so I've got an outline, but I don't have anything more than that. So I am hoping that the writing gods will bless me And uh, maybe my little sleepy country town that I live in, I'm 45 minutes north of uh, San Francisco in what we call out here the Sonoma wine country. And that's kind of pushing it just a little bit. But uh, we live in a town where it's pretty much all acreage. So all our neighbors, you know, are far away. And I just feel like in order to to write, I need a certain kind of energy and country energy doesn't seem to provide it. There's something about being in a big city that uh, just engages my brain, but obviously not enough for me to get anything more than my outline done. So I am delighted to be back here. I have not recorded in my office where I normally record um, since August, the end of August. So we did a bunch of batch recordings with guests right before I left. I love, though, when I can just come to you and it's just me. So anyway, before I start, 
I would love to read and thank a few of our listeners for their wonderful reviews because I haven't done that for over a month. They really do help to spread the word so we can help even more women with ADHD. So first off, we have Katie Wire 9189 and the title of her review is RN Relates. As a mom drawn to psychiatric nursing in an emergency room, I was searching for what was wrong with me. After getting diagnosed with ADHD five months ago, I am hyper fixated on learning more about it. I'm enjoying listening to this kind and brilliant woman with relatable experiences. I also enjoy your Facebook group. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Katie Wire. I'm not often called kind and brilliant. Maybe I am, but you know, I'm like you. So I read that and I'm like, really? Me? <laughs> A little bit of that imposter complex, perhaps. Then we have Smeglia. Gosh, I'm sorry if I massacred that. And her title of her podcast review is Life Changing and Empowering. This podcast is changing my life. I have just discovered it. So I'm catching up on all of the old episodes and learning so much about myself. More importantly, I'm learning how to accept myself and see my unique brain as my superpower instead of my weakness. I'm a 30-year-old law student recently diagnosed and struggling to get through grad school. This podcast has been a lifeline for me in a very difficult time, and I am so grateful for it and for the way my appreciation of myself is growing because of it. Thank you. I'm so delighted to hear that, especially since we're fellow, oh, I don't know, members of the law, maybe. The next one is from Gilbert Melissa 34, and she captions her review, Life Changing and Powerful. Tracy, I don't know how to thank you. A friend introduced me to your podcast, and it has been life changing for me. I was diagnosed as a child, and I never knew what that meant. I just thought it meant I couldn't focus and I would get distracted easily. This podcast has put so many things into perspective for me, and I've never felt so normal in my life. Thank you for bringing things full circle for me. Your voice is powerful, and I appreciate you. Well, I appreciate you too. Thank you so much for your kind words. Um, yeah, it's all about the gold stars, right? And then finally, Sue579, and she has captioned her review, My Family. I found my ADHD family after listening to Tracy interview a variety of guests with successful careers slash lifestyles that are experiencing the same things that I do. I'm fortunate to have an amazing family, friends, and clients, but I know that most of them are unable to understand the way my brain works even though they love me and the way I process things. With this podcast, my ADHD life is spoken by other people, so I don't feel alone. This podcast has made me feel supported just by knowing that my struggles and talents are not just my own. It's amazing what happens, right, when we focus on our strengths instead of our weaknesses. And it is also amazing how the shame dissipates when we discover that we're not alone and that you start seeing all these brilliant ADHD brains and you think, well, if I can look at them and they're all so brilliant and I'm part of this group too, then I must be just as brilliant as they are. And you are, right? Just so long as you're in your area of interest. Okay. So last week, let's get started with the podcast. Thank you again so much for your kind words. Last week, we discovered why we struggle with time. We know that our ADHD brains, they just prefer to live in this unconstrained flow of time where we can move smoothly from one thing to another when we feel like it. You know, that's the natural flow for our brains. And it's because we know that we don't see or feel time like a neurotypical would. We can't feel how long 15 minutes is. We also can't see 15 minutes which is why we struggle with digital clocks because they're just numbers. We're much better with analog clocks where we can see the hands move around the watch face. We're also easily distracted, right? We love the bright, shiny. We can have the best laid plans, but all of a sudden something will attract our attention and there we go. But you know what? That is also why we're so creative, right? That distractibility. We can see all kinds of things all at the same time, and then organize them in a way that a lot of other people haven't even thought about. 
We also struggle because we hyperfocus. So we struggle to start. That is usually what our big struggle is. So when we finally can start, we don't want to stop, right? We want to finish. We want to get it off of our, our desk, our table, whatever it is that we're working on. We also have working memory issues. We forget what we're supposed to be working on. That's why I love that app. God, I got to look it up. Um, I can't even remember what it's called. It is called Tab Resize, and it's a Chrome app, and it allows you to get a second screen and then divide the screen into, you know, two pieces or four pieces so you can have everything up there at one time. And so you're not constantly going out and searching for something, and then all of a sudden you realize that you're into a completely different tab, you're into a completely different browser, and you can't even remember what you were originally working on, right? So if you can have everything up there in one screen and you can move things around, it just makes life so much easier because you're constantly focused on what you're supposed to be working on. We also struggle with emotional regulation. I don't feel like it. So I don't want to make that decision now, and I don't know when I'm going to feel like it, so I don't really want to even schedule when I'm going to make that decision. And then finally, we know that, you know, it's not a character or moral issue. We are late. We are typically poor planners because of neurobiology, specifically, you know, we have challenges with our executive functions, which occur in the prefrontal cortex, so it's that front part of the brain. But get this, ADHD is about time management, but it's also about emotion. So Craig Strohmeyer and uh, Dr. Russ Ramsey, they conducted a study in 2015, and they looked at ADHD in adults and cognitive distortions. So cognitive distortions are things like, you know, you're comparing yourself to others. You struggle with emotional reasoning. Maybe you magnify issues. You know, it's a small little issue, but you kind of blow it up and make it a big deal. Mind reading, you think you can read what other people are thinking. (laughs) Do you do that too? Minimization, ah, it's not a big deal. It'll be fine. And perfectionism. Now, this was so interesting to me. Perfectionism, out of all of those cognitive distortions, was the most frequently endorsed cognitive distortion by a long shot. It was experienced by over 50% of participants with ADHD. Interesting, isn't it? But this wasn't the perfection that we're used to hearing about, you know, where you keep doing things until they're absolutely perfect. And so you don't even want to start because, you know, When are you going to be able to make it perfect? This perfection among ADHDers, it showed up as an inability to even start because they were waiting for that perfect time where they'd actually feel like doing the chore or feel like doing the task. And the problem is it just never or rarely arrives, right? So you can't even start because, again, you just don't feel like it. The study found that ADHDers, we have a really low tolerance for that emotional discomfort. So our perfectionism is tied to emotional self-regulation. It is tied to emotion. Now, I talk about this all the time, right? When we're in our head and we're going over all the options, we think we're moving forward, but we really aren't. And it's not until we actually get into action that it becomes clear what it is that we actually need to do next. You know, that accomplishment or that action then ratchets up our dopamine, which motivates us to take the next action. So even more action. And so you can imagine how frustrating it is to want to do something and you can't even start because you're waiting for that perfect time and that perfect time never comes. This is the thing, though, when we understand why we are the way we are and how our brains work, only then can we implement strategies to be better around time and planning and actually getting things done. So what is it that we can actually do? It always comes back to that big, bold pause, right? We can pause. We can pay attention to how our body actually feels. So you want to ask yourself, okay, where am I feeling this stress in my body when I want to start this thing, but I can't seem to start because I'm overtaken by all of this emotion around starting? 
And then you can ask, okay, what does that stress feel like? Does it feel like I'm kind of jumping out of my skin? Do you ever get that feeling or that there's butterflies in my stomach? Do I feel the discomfort in my throat? Then what you're going to do is you're going to process what about this specific current situation is bothering me so much? Why is it generating these feelings in my body, these icky feelings that I don't want to feel? Now, you've probably heard the phrase name it to tame it. So that's exactly what you're going to do. You're going to really think about, okay, what about this current situation is making me feel anxious? Do I feel anxious because I have so much to do that I don't know where to start? Or I can't even begin until I know what supplies I need? Or what I know about myself is that I feel like this when I have a lot to do and I can't seem to get anything to stick. You know, I know for myself, I'm really impatient. I also know because there's so much going on in my head and I'm not able to get anything to work, that that's what's actually making me anxious right now. It's all of those thoughts and I can't seem to put any of them to rest. I can't cross anything off my list. I can't check it off, you know, as done. So again, you're going to process What about the current situation is bothering you? And then you're going to name it to tame it. It's just so interesting. The minute we name it, the anxiety and the stress around it it literally just dissipates. It really does lessen if you try this. Then what you're going to do is you're going to take the time to create a plan. So I always ask myself, what has worked for me in the past? And I ask my, my students and my clients this all the time too. They are always the first line of defense in knowing what to try because there are ways that they have done things that they are successful in. And so the problem is they usually don't pause long enough to realize that, oh, you know what? When I did it that way, it actually worked. So can I apply that situation to this situation? So you're going to take the time to create a plan. Again, you're going to Ask yourself, what has worked for you in the past? What works for me, I know, is to slow down. What works for me is to get what's in my head on paper and apply action to one little thing at a time and not just give up and move on to the next thing because I'm feeling uncomfortable. I mean, sometimes I have to, like, you know, I can't do the next step because I didn't realize that there was another step that had to be done before I could handle the step I'm on. But let me give you an example. So I just started taking a class in visual facilitation. I realized that words bog me down. And so if I could create graphic images of my processes, what works for me, I wouldn't have to access my vocabulary first, right? I could just call up the images, you know, look on a sheet of paper, look at the images and use them to trigger what it is that I want to say. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but somehow I think it does. So in any case, I attended the first session of this visual facilitation training when we were in New York City and I was in, you know, the apartment and I suspect that what was going on was too much around me because I missed all of the steps of what I was supposed to even be doing as I was sitting through the training. And I started to panic because the pens we were supposed to get had to be ordered from Germany and there was a certain kind of paper we needed. And I am so not an artist and I didn't know what to do. And I felt like everybody else was organized and ready to go. And I literally just created this whirlwind of anxiety and negative emotion because I didn't know where to go to get the answers to my questions. Now, when I finally paused and I calmly looked at the instructions, I discovered that there was a link for the art supplies where you just clicked on the link and it put everything in your shopping cart. And then the materials were sent three-day delivery from Germany to your front door. So all the positive emotion I got from easily ordering the supplies then caused me to try and draw the figures that were part of our homework. So we kind of had to learn like, okay, you draw a circle and then, you know, you put a little, I don't know, a little oval on it. You create this bean person and this is how you do the hands. You know, it was just all so overwhelming to me. But when I took the time to just calmly follow the instructions, all the positive emotion that I got 
from easily ordering the supplies then caused me to try and draw the figures that were part of our homework. And I realized that I had made such a big deal about all of this, but I could actually do it. And what I was drawing looked pretty damn good. I was actually kind of impressed with myself. But what I had done is I had paused. I had paid attention to the discomfort that I was feeling because I was, you know, I had to do something that I just wasn't used to doing. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't think I could do it. And when I paused and I paid attention to this discomfort, what I got was this high energy, high anxiety, flitting feeling in my body. And I realized that this has happened to me many times before. And if I just spend 15 minutes trying to figure it out by reading what was clearly presented to me, I could place the order for these supplies and I could move on. Because, you know, my pattern is that when I can't figure something out right away, I just move on to something else. I'm impatient. But then I take that anxiety and restlessness with me into the next task. And it would also then take me double as long to resolve the situation because I'd have to start completely over because by then I would have forgotten what I had already learned. Do you ever do that? So I know about myself that I have a very low tolerance for emotional discomfort. I also know from firsthand experience how impatient I am. But because I know that about myself, what I now do is I force myself to stick with it. So. You know, I force myself to do a couple, you know, of those, what do I call them? Four, seven, eight breathing, you know, techniques. I think that's what it's called. I don't know. I always change the number. But in any case, what I do is I breathe in for four counts and then I hold it for six or seven and then I breathe out for eight. So I'm just trying to calm my nervous system. And once I get it calm, I do that a couple times then I force myself to just focus on what is in front of me. Take five minutes to actually read the instructions instead of popping off. And, you know, it's like, well, where is it? And what do I do? And I'm posting in the Facebook group. And I'm sure, you know, the the instructor is just like, oh my God, that woman, right? So that then leads me to the next step, which is step five. So When I stick it out and I'm able to complete a task, then what I need to do is I need to take the time to celebrate my accomplishment. Why? Because I want to link the positive emotion I'm feeling with the action so that the next time this happens, I have some history to lean on, which makes me more apt to get into action rather than just walking away or running away or just plain failing to start. I hope this makes sense. So I want to review with you. We need to get something done, okay? Let's just say you've got something you need to get done, but you can't start because you're waiting for that perfect time, right? And you're just not sure when you're going to feel that perfect time and you feel that discomfort in your body. You're going to take a couple deep breaths. You're going to pause and you can take deep breaths through every single one of these steps. So number one is you pause, right? Number two is you feel the discomfort. Number three, you process it. You name it. What about the situation is making you feel this discomfort? Number four, you create a plan, hopefully based on history. What can you do that you've done in the past that has worked to get through whatever it is you need to get through? For me, I know I take a couple deep breaths and I focus on slowly reading the instructions. If it means I need to print them out, if it means I need to get a highlighter, that's what I do. And then based on what I have now learned, I create a plan, hopefully based on history, right? I know that if I name it, if I'm able to feel the discomfort, I'm then able to create a plan based on history, based on what was, has worked for me in the past. A couple deep breaths, you know, printing out the instructions, clearing everything off of my desk. And so I am only working on that one thing and giving it just 15 minutes because I know if I can lock myself on or in in 15 minutes, 
I can figure this out. I always figure it out. It might be when you want to pull up your Datex cube, you know, I talk about that all the time and I just put it on its head on 25 minutes and the deal I strike with myself is, you know, sometimes it's 15 minutes, often it's 25 minutes. That's all you have to do. And once you're done with 25 minutes, you can walk away. Well, I never walk away. And then number five is once you've done what you need to do, you really need to celebrate your success. You need to link the fact that you stayed in, you locked in, you, you know, kind of stared down the discomfort, paused and breathed, and guess what? You figured it out. So because you've been able to figure it out in the past, Remember all those times? You can now figure it out today. So that was all about just getting started. Now let's talk about deconstructing time, trying to get somewhere on time. How about that? That seems to be one of our big struggles. Now, just because you're one of these people that's always on time doesn't mean you're not ADHD, right? I have a son who is never late. He is always five minutes early. I drive him nuts. I drive my husband nuts too. But my daughter and I were just exactly like each other, so we're good. (laughs) So what you're going to do is you're going to pause. Again, it's always about the pause, right? This is not our nature. This is not how our brain naturally works. We don't naturally pause. We're rarely in our body because we're in our head, which is why we have no concept of time. Has that ever happened where you lose something and you can't even recreate your steps in your head because you're not in your body, right? You're not in your body when you're running around the house. So who knows where you lost your phone or left your keys? The other thing is we will almost always underestimate how much time something will actually take. I call us time optimists. You know, And pausing, it's just not something we do. Now, if we would pause more, we would be able to get out of our head and get into our body. We would be better at actually predicting how much time things take because we would have taken the time to time ourselves to figure that out. But pausing is just not something we typically do. We also, pausing again, we don't think after the fact or even during the fact, right? Now, how long did that take me? We'll also argue and fight to not have to do more work that we don't want to do, right? I've got this. I don't need to do that. I'll be on time. Don't worry about me. I can do one more thing and still be on time. Does it even matter that I'm on time? (laughs) Does that ever happen to you? So it's not enough to just pause to estimate. We then need to pause to do brief, right? Again, we're in our heads. We need to get into our bodies. We need to pay attention. We need to deconstruct after the fact. No, I can't run that errand in 30 minutes because the last time I remember, it took me, when I timed myself, 20 minutes to drive there, 10 minutes to find parking, 15 minutes to actually find the items that I needed in the store, five minutes to check myself out. So that was 50 minutes, not 30 minutes. And it didn't include what the traffic was going to be like. It didn't include me getting distracted. It didn't include that, hey, there may be a line and it may take more than five minutes to check out. Or, you know, you can't find an item. You can't find someone to help you. It doesn't include any of that. We think We can get 25 things done in an hour, and usually we can't. Again, we're time optimists. So we have to learn how to pause. Pause is always going to be my number one, you know, where we start, right? We have to learn how to pause so that we can see the future, so that we can feel the future, so that we can estimate, and then we can also debrief after the fact. So now I want to talk about the concept of backward planning. Now, with neurotypicals, where they usually start is, okay, it's the goal, right? I've got this paper that's due next Friday. I'm going to get the paper done. And they get it done. With an ADHD brain, though, we need to start with thinking and planning so that we can actually set reasonable goals. Otherwise, we're setting ourselves up to fail. So what we have to do is we have to start by visualizing the end result. 
you've heard people say you have to start with the end in mind. Well, that is for the ADHD brain. Remember, in our brains, positive emotion is tied to motivation. So by visualizing the end result, first, we start and really harness all that expected positive emotion, that good feeling that triggers motivation. We feel successful. We use that positive emotion then to carry us through to action. When we start with the end in mind, then we can think back and go through all the steps that are going to have to happen so that we can successfully reach that end result. It also gives us a much better sense of how time passes because we're pausing to create the steps, you know, when we backward plan. So let me give you an example. So again, you know, my son is a sophomore at NYU. Let's say he's writing a paper. Actually, I think he is writing a paper and I think it's, it's due sometime, I think this week. And it's on the relationship between historical stages and geography. I don't even barely know what that means, but I was talking to him about it. And so what he did is he starts with visualizing. He could do it in his head or he could actually draw. Like, what is it going to look like when I'm done? So that positive emotion, because he's already going to be there at the end, like he's done it, right? He's thinking this, right? Or he's drawing it. So that positive emotion, because it's going to generate positive emotion, is going to drive his motivation. So he's going to start with the end in mind. And then he's going to ask himself, what steps do I need to take to match this image of being done that he's drawn or he's visualizing in his head, right? Well, he was given a list of philosophers, right? So he has to research these philosophers. Then he has to narrow these philosophers down to three to support his observation. Now, in this paper, he's not allowed to have an opinion. According to his professor, they don't know enough yet to have an opinion. So he doesn't have to worry about having an opinion. But then he's got to outline his observations. After that, he needs to set up a meeting with his TA to make sure he's on the right track. Then he needs to update his outline. That's followed by starting his rough draft. And that's followed by editing his rough draft. Finally, the very last thing he's going to do is he's going to submit his paper online. But what he's done is he's created all of these steps that are going to get him to submitting his paper online. So he needs to think about, okay, well, what materials do I need to compile to complete this paper? You know, a lot of times with kids, they just kind of show up, right? Are they professor-provided resources that he needs to pull together? Are there online resources that he needs to get? Are there personal interviews that he actually needs to get? So again, you know, when he was in high school, he didn't do any of this. He just knew the, he had a paper due, but he hadn't thought through any part of how he was going to actually get the paper done. He would just show up the night before. He didn't have the right books. He forgot the assignment sheet. And then he'd feel like everything was all outside his control because he hadn't thought it through. Right now, he didn't have any of these materials. He hadn't backward planned. He'd just gone right to, I'm turning my paper in on Friday. Okay. And it's Thursday night and here I am. But I... I don't have the materials. I can't do it. So that's the first step. But the backward planning isn't enough because once Marcus has turned his paper in, so he's now done, right? The backward planning would require him to review what he's done and how it went. Again, you're taking the time to pause and you're asking yourself, okay, what worked and what didn't? What should I do differently next time? where, you know, everything would just work out. Um, it'd be easier. Things would work out better. And what was it that took me longer than I expected it to take? And then what was it that went quicker? And how much time did all of these things actually take me? So what we're doing here with backward planning is we're teaching ourselves how to see and feel time. You're starting with the end result, and then you're working a backwards plan. Now, our ADHD brains will rarely think, hey, it's going to take a lot of time, so I better get on this, right? No, we'll jump to, you know what? It's not due for 30 days. I have tons of time. And the question really is, well, do you really have 30 days? Because you're working three days a week, so now you've got 12 days, right? 
You're on vacation one of those weeks, so now you've got nine days. And there's two holidays in there, so now you're at seven days. So actually, you, you have one week. But our brains... We just go, right? We're not pausing to actually think it through. We jump right to, hey, I've got 30 days of uninterrupted time to work on it. Feels like so much time, but it's not. We don't have 30 days. When we actually pause and we take the time to discover how much time we have, we realize, you know what? It's not that much time. So if you're interested in improving your executive function skills or your child's executive function skills, there are a couple of resources that are highly recommended by a lot of ADHD coaches, including ADCA. Um, The two that I have um, some experience with are Mary D. Sklar, and she has a program called Seeing My Time. And then Sarah Ward is an, ex- is an expert on teaching planning and all other aspects of executive function. And you can find her at efpractice.com. And I'll post these links in the show notes. Now, Dr. Russell Barkley, he is one of the leading experts in the field of ADHD. He argues that, you know, ADHD, it's really just deficits in executive functioning. And if these are poor, then of course you're going to struggle with time management. I agree with him. So let's talk about learning how to pause, learning backward planning. Like what else can we touch on? Well, we need to figure out how much time things take. I hinted earlier about that, right? So so let's get practical. How do we do this? Well, what we're really trying to do is we're trying again to teach ourselves how to see and feel time. Now, I'm not perfect. I never will be with anything to do with time or scheduling, but I'm a hell of a lot better than I used to be. One of the things that has really helped me to actually understand how time passes is called a time timer. Now, the time timer, it's a three and a half by three and a half inch timer. It's kind of blue. Well, I think they're made in different colors. The one I have is turquoise. And there's basically an analog watch face or timer face on it. And when you set the timer for 15 minutes, you're going to see a pie shaped red section appear that covers the 15 minutes on the timer face. So once you set it, For 15 minutes, the red section is going to get smaller and smaller as the 15 minutes counts down. So you can really see the passage of time. I think this would be great for kids to see the passage of time, to learn what it looks like when time passes. So what does 15 minutes actually look like? What does 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 60 minutes actually look like, you know, when I'm trying to do my homework? So that was the first thing that I bought, the first thing that I did, and it kind of blew me away. I realized that, first of all, time passes a lot faster in most cases than I thought it did. What I also started to realize is that the more I time myself, the better I get at estimating how much time things take. Duh, right? (laughs) If you don't know how long things take, how can you accurately estimate them? So I want to give you an example. I was always late in the morning and my kids and my husband were usually in the car waiting for me and often they would get tardies because of me. Not good, right? Unfortunately, I didn't know that I had ADHD until my son was 12. And so I just thought, oh my God, why are you so selfish? You know? But the problem is that I would plan to be there on time or I thought I was planning to be there on time. I didn't want to be late. I didn't want my kids to get a tardy. I felt terrible about it. And the other part of it is if you're constantly running late in the morning, you have all this adrenaline. So We know that our cortisol levels are highest in the morning already, right? So I was starting out my day already in the negative. So it dawned on me that if I could figure out how to not be late first thing in the morning, that that would likely set my whole day in a better direction. I could eliminate all that morning chaos. No one would be upset with me. And I wouldn't feel selfish and guilty when they were late because they wouldn't be late. So that would be a good plan, right? So I started to look at what I needed to do in the morning, and I started to estimate how long it would take me. So initially, I estimated that I could easily go from the shower to out the door in 30 minutes. So I gave myself 30 minutes, and I was still late, like late by a lot. 
So I started to break everything down. And I realized that I had estimated when I broke it all down that it would take me 10 minutes for the shower. Okay. That was pretty much the first thing I did. Well, I worked out in the morning. So I seemed to be just fine getting up on time, getting through my workout. But where I got stuck was the shower. And the reason was because I had estimated 10 minutes for the shower. But when I timed myself, it was like 20 to 25 minutes. Again, we're time optimists, right? We always think we can accomplish more than we can. And guess what? The shower is... It's pretty therapeutic, right? It's warm in there, especially on cold days. It feels good. It increases dopamine. It increases BDNF, which is that miracle grow for the brain. You know, we need it for neuroplasticity. It also increases creativity. So I don't know about you, but my best thoughts happen first in the shower. Well, it's probably equal. They happen in the shower and they happen while working out. So I would get in there. I would get into the shower and I would get in my head and I would totally lose track of time. Just the shower alone would totally throw my whole schedule out the window. Yet I still somehow thought I could get all this done. I could get in and out of the shower in 10 minutes. And that got me thinking, how am I going to hack this? Well, I know or I knew at the time that there were three ways to motivate the ADHD brain, right? Okay, so the first one was interest. But I knew in this particular situation, it was not going to work. There is nothing more boring to me then that whole morning routine, the shower, the blow dry, the makeup, I, I just hate it. In fact, I, I was interviewed for an article about uh, ADHD and like self-care routines and how, how we struggle. And I remember talking to um, the, um, one of the writers of New Beauty magazine, and I was telling her that I hate dealing with makeup. And so my hack was that I would do all my makeup in the car. So that 30 minutes that it took me or so I thought to get out of the house, that didn't even include makeup because I do my makeup in the car. It's just too boring for me to sit in front of a makeup mirror. Of course, I'm not driving. I couldn't do that if I was driving. So anyway, we've got three ways to motivate the ADHD brain. We've got interest. That wasn't going to work. We've got fear. Well, I mean, I guess the fear was that my kids were going to be late, but it wasn't a big enough fear because, you know, it was my kids and not me. Isn't that terrible? Because, you know, the weird thing is I would never have been late for any kind of a business meeting, but somehow those mornings with the kids' schedule, I just, I really, really struggled with it. So the third thing is challenge, right? challenge kind of piqued my interest. And I was like, okay, that's the one I'm going to go for. That's how I'm going to motivate myself. I'm going to play games with myself because I know I love a challenge. So my game was, I'm going to beat my last time. So what I did is I bought a waterproof clock for the shower. And then I bought another one that I suctioned to my mirror in the bathroom. And I then set the timer for five minutes in the shower. And I tried to beat the clock. Now, clearly, I couldn't even do 10 minutes before, right? I was still at, what, 20, 25 minutes? But if I made it a challenge, I could actually do five minutes. And I think it was because I didn't get lost in, I know it was, I didn't get lost in my head in the shower because I was so focused on the challenge of trying to beat that timer. I needed, and I mean, I do a lot in the shower, right? But I was able to get out of the shower in five minutes because it was a challenge. Now, if the thought of this is more than you can bear, just estimate how much time you think it's going to take you and then triple it because that is usually what we need. This is really important too. You know, all ADHD brains are wired differently. You've heard me say that ad nauseum. So what works for me won't necessarily work for you, but you can use it as a jumping off point. You can try it. You know, if one of your struggles is you spend too much time in the shower too, you struggle to get out of the house in time, then try this. See if it works for you. So what I'm doing here or what I was doing here uh, with the shower was I was building scaffolding. I was creating structure, right? And again, my scaffolding. And, you know, you need to make sure that my scaffolding actually works for your brain too. 
You know, and I'm all about simple. So I'm always trying to simplify my approach down to the bare minimum because then I'm more apt to use it regularly. Simple also means it's got to be within sight because remember, out of sight, out of mind for our brains. So the reason the shower timer and the mirror timers work so well for me is because they're always front and center. So I don't forget what my intention is. I don't forget that I actually have this morning goal of being on time and beating the clock and making sure that my kids are on time. And that really matters. Again, it's about the pause, right? That you're taking the time to ask yourself, what kind of person do I want to be? Do I want to be the kind of mom whose kids constantly show up late? Do I want to be the kind of mom that the kids start their day in the morning and they're mad at me, right? And then they have to go and get a detention. And I mean, this didn't happen that many times, but it did happen a few times. And I just... I didn't want to be that kind of mom. So if I have big goals, the question is, how am I going to move myself forward so I can accomplish my goals? Time management, it requires attention. It also requires distraction management, right? That you are distracting yourself, certainly for me, from all those thoughts that would start percolating in the shower. So it's a constant ongoing process of pausing and becoming aware of what's going on with you, what's going on with your brain in that instance, and then understanding, oh, well, that's why I do that, and then tweaking what works, and then getting rid of what doesn't. So again, every brain's wired differently. You have to test what works for you. I want to share a story that I heard a while ago, and I just love it. I've told it before. So Sandy Maynard was working on her master's thesis, and unfortunately, she was given only a suggested deadline. And you know how we are with suggested deadlines. Yeah, they may as as well not even exist, right? And she just wasn't getting anything done on her master's thesis. So this is what she did. Creative ADHD brain that she has. She hired herself a nanny, and this is what she said. So last month, I hired someone to watch over me. That's right, a nanny. I gave her strict instructions. She was to arrive at 8 a.m., fix breakfast for me, and make sure I was at my desk by 9 o'clock. There was to be no radio, no TV, no telephone, no email, and I'm sure no social media, too. At 10.30, I was allowed a 15-minute break to go to the bathroom. Total structure is what she's building here get a drink of water, no soda, and grab a carrot, yogurt, or some other healthy food. At 12.15 p.m. sharp, I was to have my lunch ready. At 1.15, I had to be back at my desk where I was to work until 5 p.m. One last instruction to my nanny was for her to call me at 10 p.m. to remind me to go to bed. Yep, I need that. Just about the only thing I didn't ask her to do was to shoot me if I tried to leave my desk between breaks. I cannot tell you what a difference she made. After months of procrastination, I am now close to finishing my thesis. I've completed four drafts and I'm halfway through my final draft. I'm confident that I will finish before the current quarter is over. Taking twice as long to do my thesis as my classmate makes me feel different. But I have to remind myself that I am different. After all, who but someone with ADHD would even think to hire a nanny? You know, while writing my thesis, I started at 9 a.m. and I ended at 5 p.m. So I had time to socialize in the evening. This was pre-COVID. Knowing I would quit at 5 kept me going. I could say to myself, only two more hours, only one more hour, and so on. If I hadn't committed to stopping at 5, I might have thought, I'll take a break and do something else and work on it later in the evening. This kind of thinking is dangerous for people with ADHD who are easily distracted. This really hit home for me. I often work late at night, and that's what allows me to get distracted during the day, right? I love Sandy's story. Think about it. We have these nonlinear brains, these creative brains. So why not get creative about time management and planning? Ask yourself, how can I make this challenging? How can I make it fun? How can I make sure that I put in structures that keep me from getting distracted? And then once we get it done, how can we celebrate our successes so that we can embed this success into our memory and be able to recall it the next time we're up against a similar challenge? So as I'm sitting here listening to myself talk, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I need to hire a nanny to get me through my book proposal. What do you think about that? 
Anyway, let me know what works for you. What is it that you need to get done? And what are the structures that you are going to put in place to ensure that you get done what you really want to get done? As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. Come join me over for free at tracyoutsuka.com. If you like what you're hearing, I'd love if you would drop me a review. Or if you'd like to suggest a guest or topic idea for this podcast, feel free to write me at support at tracyoutsuka.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is a OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.